The deafening hiss of escaping steam, the sound of flames licking at wood, the spitting crackle of burning planks, and a thick, choking expanse of black smoke. But much more harrowing is the sound of hundreds of screams. Screams of people trapped, begging for help. Screams of people being crushed and burned alive. Men running to and fro, trying their damnedest to rescue the trapped, the injured, the dying, and to recover the dead. All around, some of those that are lucky enough to escape wander aimlessly, or sit on the dew-soaked ground, their eyes either flooded with tears, or permanently fixed with thousand-yard stares on their smoke-stained faces. Two men stare down in abject horror from the signal box. They both knew that they had just caused one of the most horrific accidents in railway history. In total, their actions would lead to a catastrophic crash involving five different trains. Hundreds of lives now hung in the balance. Today, Descent into Darkness investigates Britain's worst railway disaster, Quintins Hill. The passing loop at Quintins Hill on the West Coast Main Line, even today, is a rather unremarkable place. Sitting just north of the Scottish border, hundreds of thousands of passengers fly through on their way to Glasgow or down to London every single year without giving it a second thought. A real blink-and-you-miss-it kind of place. It only stretches less than half a mile and consists of four tracks providing a passing place to set aside slower-moving trains to allow the faster expresses to pass. There was also a, a trailing set of points to allow for trains to transfer from one main line to the other. That's it. Nothing special. However, in doing this, it provides a vital function in the efficient running of a high-speed line. No more was this efficiency needed than during the First World War, where masses of freshly recruited and trained troops needed to be moved up and down the country. The entirety of the railway system was temporarily taken over by the ROD, or Rail Operating Department. The companies could still run their usual services, but troop trains were the, of, of the utmost priority, and everything that wasn't quick enough must stand aside. A lot of the time, troop trains had to be hastily assembled from whatever spare coaching stock was lying around, or even knocking coaches out of pre-assembled consists. Some trains were having to be run with ancient stock that probably should have been scrapped years before. As well as the extra movements for troop trains, there was also the so-called Jellico trains, these were coal trains that took their cargo to the ports in the north of Scotland to be taken on to Scapa Flow and Admiral John Jellicoe's Grand Fleet, the pride of the Royal Navy. Another little quirk of British railway operations is the so-called parliamentary trains, or parleys. The parliamentary train was a passenger service that was mandated by law that it had to provide said service, despite any other issue, including profits and losses. Some of these services are still in existence today on the more remote lines less travelled. In a somewhat spiteful response to this imposition, the railway companies had taken to running their mandatory parley trains at strange timings like super early in the morning, and even then perhaps as little as only once a week, sometimes without a return service. This got them around the law because they could say, hand on heart, that they had fulfilled their legal obligations. Parleys were also held in low priority on the train pecking order, and so were liable to suffer innumerable delays due to others such as expresses needing to pass, so the parley would be set aside to allow this, hence the need for places such as Quinton's Hill. Both troop train and a parley would play a part in the upcoming disaster. And before we go any further, I must go extra nerdy at this point for the purpose of exposition, and give you the cliff notes on how railways are safely operated, i.e. the signalling system. Fundamentally, railway signalling has changed very little to up to the present day once the initial kinks were ironed out after some serious incidents. This became the block system, in which trains were held until the one before had travelled a known distance ahead. Sounds obvious, I know, but before this, it had only relied on a certain amount of time passing, which could mean that the all-clear could be given even if the previous train had broken down just out of sight, hence the change to the block system. Signals were placed at predetermined distances that allowed plenty of room for braking. At the time, and sometimes still found today, signals are controlled mechanically by a series of levers at a localised building called a signal box. 
Each signalman can communicate to the next box either way to let them know that a train is coming. Once a route was set in advance of an expected train passing through their section, standard practice was to place a metal hoop over the handle of the lever, which physically stops the lever lock from being released until the train has passed and the hoop removed. These hoops are alternately called lever collars or reminder appliances. In addition to this, every single movement in communication had to be entered into the train register, a big book that sat on a table at one end of the box. Three rules that are relevant to the story are also worthy of mention. The first is Rule 55. This states that whenever a train is held on the main line, not on a passing loop, for more than three minutes, one of the train crew must attend the signalman to remind him of the train's presence and to ensure that all protections are in place, such as lever collars, etc. That man was also to countersign the train register to prove that every step had been followed satisfactorily. The second part is the so-called blocking back procedure. This is reserved for when a train is to be held on the opposite line, i.e. crossing from one line to the other, to allow another train to pass. The blocking back procedure involves letting the next boxes in both directions know the intentions, which means that they would not be able to offer another train into that section until the path was clear. The third rule is that no extra persons are to remain in the signal box for any longer than is strictly necessary to avoid any potential distractions. On a side note, another strange quirk of the British system is that if you are heading toward London, then you are going on the up line, and if not, you're going down. Trains and tracks are labelled accordingly as up and down. The last little piece is to note that whilst the signal box itself had panoramic windows providing clear views in both directions and out front, the lever frame at Quinton's Hill was at the back of the box, with the signalmen working with their back to the line. They only ever needed to look out the window if there was a problem, or as a train passed to ensure that the tail light was present on the end of the train. This was important as the absence of a tail light is an indicator that the train could have possibly accidentally split. With this information in mind, as much as can be practically expected from the system is in place to prevent accident. However, two elements that cannot be accounted for is failure, either mechanical or electrical. And of course, the third, the mother of so many problems, human error, which is our star antagonist of today's tale. The two regular signalmen that manned Quinton's Hill box were George Meekin and James Tinsley. These two men had been working together for quite some time. Meekin would work the night shift and Tinsley the day. The shift swap times occurred at 0600 and 1800. However, this familiarity had allowed procedural slackness to creep in. Tinsley was regularly late for his turn of duty, and so to cover for his colleague, Meekin would stay on duty until he was relieved, as one would expect. However, Crucially, he would write down the entries to be made in the train register on a separate piece of paper for Tinsley to copy into the real book in his own hand, so any inspection would not uncover the informal arrangement. The reason for Tinsley's lateness was that the local Parley train would regularly be shunted aside to allow the following express to pass. Tinsley, who lived in Gretna, would catch the Parley and get off if the train was booked to stand at Quinton's Hill to be shunted aside for the late express to overtake. This also allowed Tinsley to have a slightly longer lay in bed. Meekin would inform him of whether this was to occur or not. Just as it would today, if this arrangement was uncovered by management, there would be hell to pay, so it made sense for both men to stick to the arrangement. Unfortunately, it was precisely this that would lead to the impending disaster. On the morning of the accident, an up troop train was carrying men of the 7th Battalion Royal Scots Regiment from Leith, namely the Battalion HQ staff and Companies A and D, 498 men of all ranks in total. They were on their way down to Liverpool in preparation to board ships that would take them to the upcoming Gallipoli Peninsula campaign in the Ottoman Empire. They were due to pass through Quinton's Hill at 0649. That morning, Quinton's Hill was quite the hive of activity. The downline passing loop had already been occupied by a freight train to allow the Parley and two late-running expresses to pass, the latter of which was due through at 06.50. The down Parley arrived at 06.30, and three minutes later had reversed through the crossover onto the up main. Tinsley got out of the train and made his way over to the box. 
he was quickly followed by George Hutchinson, the fireman of the Parley who had, who had come up to sign the train register. By 0634, Tinsley had technically taken over control of the box from Meakin. At the time, an empty Jellicoe coal train was in the process of entering the up-passing loop to allow the troop train to pass. Tinsley had gotten straight on with the copying of the entries into the train register that Meakin had written down for him. In the meantime, Hutchinson sat down and read the newspaper. He did not bother to ensure that the lever collars were in place on the signal handles and the points protecting the train. There was little point, as neither Meakin nor Tinsley ever used them anyway. Two more men had also arrived in the box, the guards from the two freight trains occupying the loops. They stood near Hutchinson and began discussing news about the war, etc. Crucially, once the parley had been reversed onto the up line, whilst the train out-of-section code had been sent south to Gretna, the blocking back code had not been sent north to Kirkpatrick. Therefore, Kirkpatrick had no idea that the parley was occupying the up main at Quintons Hill. In rapid succession, at 0638, the first of the two down expresses passed through without incident. Then, at 0642, codes came through from Kirkpatrick, offering the troop train, and four minutes later, another from Gretna, offering the late express. Perhaps through absent-mindedness or distraction at both the need to copy things into the train register and the talking going on, James Tinsley accepted both trains and cleared his signals. Had he not accepted the troop train, nothing would have been amiss. However, because he had clearly forgotten that the parley was still occupying the up main, disaster was now inevitable, and only two to three minutes away. At 06.49, the up troop train ran headlong into the front of the parley at around 75 miles per hour. The wooden-bodied coaching stock almost completely disintegrated into millions of splinters. The whole scene was transformed into a mass of twisted metal, broken wood, and above all, broken bodies. The gas-powered lighting system of the older stock of the troop train had erupted into flames, further fuelled by the huge pyre of flammable materials that had now littered the line. One could only imagine the sheer horror of the spectacle that had unfolded before people's eyes, but this was only the beginning. Just as anyone could have possibly begun to comprehend the extent of what had just happened, the Down Express had, at that moment, passed the point of no return. It had just passed the last possible signal, just before the lever could be slammed forward, sending the arm crashing back down to danger. Only a minute later, the Down Express ploughed into the wreckage. Some of the people who had just managed to escape the first crash were mown down by the Down Express. Wreckage from both crashes also hit the two waiting goods trains in the two passing loops either side of the main lines. The whole area descended into a charnel house of twisted wreckage, screams of the injured and trapped. The soldiers that could either escape or had been thrown clear, frantically trying to rescue their comrades, and the civilians from the other two trains. Unfortunately, many of the men from the troop train could not be saved. There are rumours that their fellow soldiers shot them rather than be burned alive or asphyxiated by smoke, a callous but understandable act of mercy. Nearby doctors and surgeons and nurses from the area flocked to the lonely scene of the accident to assist in the efforts, along with a flood of local civilians. The injured were transported to Gretna Hospital, but this became quickly overwhelmed by the sheer number of incoming casualties so the worst ones were transferred to the much bigger Carlisle Hospital that had much better facilities to deal with the extra patients. Some of the rescued had had to have on-the-spot amputations before they could be pulled free from the wreckage. A terrifying prospect. After as much of the victims that could be rescued as possible were saved, the men of the Royal Scots 7th Battalion that were uninjured enough to turn out for a roll call did so at 1600. Only 58 men and seven officers answered the roll. 215 of their comrades had been killed, and 191 injured. When the final butcher's bill was totted up, taking civilians into account, there were 226 deaths and 246 injuries. Some of the men could not be recovered, and their bodies were completely consumed by the fire. The mass of flammable materials and the lack of nearby water source meant that the inferno could not be finally extinguished until the following morning. 
It burned with such a fierce intensity that all the coal in the locomotive's tenders had been entirely consumed. Only six vehicles had survived intact from the troop train, as the impact had detached the couplings, and these coaches had rolled back a short way down the gradient. OK, now brace yourself for some legal wranglings. Despite the crash having occurred in Scotland, due to some of the victims having subsequently died in hospitals in England, an English coroner's court was set up. For those unfamiliar, a coroner's court is merely to hear the evidence and to establish the cause of death. If the coroner found the accused had a case to answer, he could order them indicted on charges, in this case, manslaughter. However, because the accident had occurred in Scotland, the Scottish equivalent of the coroner's court was tried by the procurator fiscal. If he found that there was a case to answer, he could also indict on charges, in this case, culpable homicide, a particular quirk of Scottish law that lies between that of manslaughter and murder. It is used in cases whilst the accused themselves had not meant to cause death by any means or motive, their actions had nonetheless led to loss of life. A lot of procedural criticism was levelled at the fact that the blocking back code was not sent to Kirkpatrick Box. However, the advocates of this are forgetting one obvious factor. A fact that is never discussed by any other videos I have seen on the subject is that the blocking back code could not be sent because of the presence of the coal train that was slowly pulling into the up loop. Therefore, by rights, until the coal train was off the main line, the blocking back could not be sent anyway, and could not be sent afterwards because it would have not made sense to the Kirkpatrick signaller. And without an actual telephone to explain the situation verbally, nothing could be done. Knowledge like this is what comes from being a train geek. I do not apologise. Further criticism was aimed at the regular failure to use reminder appliances such as lever collars, as this would very easily have prevented the crash. Even if Tinsley had forgotten about the Parley's presence on the up main, he could not have reset the signals and points without questioning why there was a collar in place in the first place. This would have no doubt jogged his memory, or indeed, he could have just looked out the window. The failure of Fireman Hutchinson and the guard of the coal train to ensure that the correct procedure had been followed was also brought into question. The fact that they seemed to be more interested in reading the paper and talk talking about the war instead of doing their job and exiting the box immediately was also heavily ridiculed. Both courts found Meekin, Tinsley and Hutchinson had been negligent. Both courts submitted their findings to their higher courts. This created the unique situation where the accused would be indicted in both England and Scotland for the same offence. However, after some back and forth between the two judiciaries, it was ultimately decided to try the case in Scotland. Meekin, Tinsley and Hutchinson were tried at the Scottish High Court in Edinburgh on the charge of culpable homicide on the 24th of September 1915. Alexander Ewer, the Lord Strathclyde and the Lord Justice General, presided over the case. The three men pled not guilty. Their defence lawyer, Condy Sanderman KC, argued that Hutchinson should be acquitted as he had no case to answer, but he did not bother to call any witnesses on the behalf of Meekin and Tinsley. His defence of them rested solely on attempting to convince the jury that neither man had been deliberately negligent and that Tinsley in particular had merely suffered from a temporary memory loss. Not exactly convincing. In summing up, the Lord Strathclyde addressed the jury thusly. At 6.43 on the morning of the day in question, the men in the signal box at Quinton's Hill were asked to accept the troop train coming from the north. They accepted it. That meant that they gave the signal to the north that the line was clear and that the troop train might safely come on. At that very moment when the signal was given, there was before the very eyes of the men in the signal box a local train which was obstructing the line on which the troop train was to run. One man in the signal box had actually left the train a few minutes before, just at the time when it was being shunted onto the up line. The other man had a few minutes before directed the local train to leave the down main and go on to the up main. That is the staggering fact that confronts you. If you can explain that fact consistently with the two men having faithfully and honestly discharged their duties, 
you should acquit them. If you cannot explain that staggering fact consistently with the men having faithfully discharged their duties, then you must convict them. The jury took only eight minutes to decide their verdict. Hutchinson was acquitted, but George Meekin was sentenced to 18 months, and James Tinsley to three years of hard labour. However, astoundingly, both men would only serve one year before being released in 1916. The locomotives of the Parley and the troop train were beyond repair and scrapped on site, but the express loco was put back into service and lived on until 1958, whereupon it was withdrawn and scrapped. A BBC documentary presented by Scottish historian Neil Oliver put forward the theory that there had been a huge conspiracy surrounding the disaster. Certainly, the soldiers who had survived were ordered to silence and the newspapers were prevented from reporting any further coverage by the War Office, as it was thought that this would prove damaging to morale both at home and abroad. However, further points were raised that would suggest that both Meekin and Tinsley had been made into scapegoats by both the Caledonian Railway Company and the War Department. This would certainly explain why Condy Sanderman had not called any witnesses on their behalf. It was suggested that the Caledonian, despite the huge increase in extra traffic, had expressed a desire to maintain their pre-war schedules as much as humanly possible to keep their revenue stream going. On top of this was the apparent lack of oversight by management to ensure that proper procedures were being followed. It is true that some signalmen at the time regarded reminder appliances as proof that the signalman did not know his job, that a proper professional didn't need them as their training and experience should be more than sufficient to ensure that no mishaps occurred. Moreover, proper oversight would have uncovered the two signalmen's secret arrangement and put a stop to it straight away. James Tinsley's forgetfulness has, in the modern day, been attributed to undiagnosed epilepsy with absent seizures. This would certainly explain his frequent lateness for work and the subsequent need to cover it up. If this illness had been found out, he would have lost his job, as such a safety-critical role cannot have any risk of random incapacitation. Does this excuse him from fault? No, absolutely not. If he knew he had a medical condition that inhibited his capacity to perform his duties, he should have made the sensible decision and informed management. The railway is, and always has been, a very understanding employer, and I am certain that they would have found him another non-safety-critical role for him to fulfil. This is proven by the fact that both men were actually re-employed by the railway company upon their release from prison in 1916, although obviously not a signalman. James Tinsley became a yard lamplighter, and George Meekin a train guard. I mean, there was a war on, you know. Even if the company couldn't or wouldn't find Tinsley an alternate job, the fact remained that he had a moral duty to inform his superiors of his condition, assuming, of course, he did indeed have one. Not only that, but let's not forget that George Meekin was still in the box at the time of the incident, and so could have easily reminded his colleague of the presence of the parlour, and would have heard the bell code coming in from Kirkpatrick. He would have known exactly what that code would have meant, and where it was coming from. And yet, he made no attempt to correct Tinsley when he accepted the troop train. On top of this was the fact that Tinsley had spent the majority of his initial few minutes after assuming control of the box copying out the entries into the train register to maintain the cover of his late arrival. Ultimately, however, the point is moot, of course. As much as we'd like to, we cannot undo what has been done. And it is therefore that even if there was some form of cover-up regarding the incident, ultimately, the blame does still lie with Meekin and Tinsley. Ultimately, they fucked around, and they found out. The Quintins Hill disaster is the worst loss of life in, in a rail crash in British history. Yes, there have unfortunately been many other horrific incidents in the intervening years, but thankfully the loss of life has been much limited due to the huge increase in safety measures, and of course, one must never forget the brave efforts of rescue workers and the technology they have at their disposal. The line through Quintins Hill was cleared and reopened to traffic three days after the accident on the 25th of May. 
The fact that so many soldiers who were still all volunteers at this point in the war were killed in a non-military incident is truly tragic, notwithstanding the loss of civilians. The soldiers were sent on to Liverpool the very next evening. They were ultimately still needed for the new offensive in Gallipoli. However, they were medically examined by the army doctors. All the enlisted men and one officer were deemed unfit for combat and were therefore returned to Battalion HQ. The remaining six officers were deemed fit for service and sent over to France to join other battalions. Whilst the men who were sent back to Edinburgh were en route, some local children mistook the traumatised, dishevelled and weary soldiers for prisoners of war and had pelted them with stones. Following the disaster, the dead were returned to Leith, the 7th Battalion's hometown, and buried in Rosebank Cemetery. 83 of the men were identified, 82 were so burned or mangled that they could not be recognised, and 50 bodies were missing from the grave as they had not been recovered from the crash. Strangely, and even more tragically, amongst the coffins were a couple that appeared to contain children. One was marked, Little Girl, Unrecognisable, and another marked, Three Trunks, meaning torsos, possibly children. Yet, no one had reported any children missing. However, this could be explained by the fact that perhaps their parents had also died. A sad aside to an even greater overall tragedy. After the war, a public fund was raised to erect a full memorial to the victims of the disaster in the cemetery where they were buried. It still stands to this day, the names etched forever in the community's collective memory. It is said that there wasn't a single household not affected by the disaster. The brave troops who had volunteered to fight for their king and country had not even had a chance to fire a shot in anger before their lives were taken. In a conflict such as the First World War that saw such pain and suffering in the mud and gore of the trenches, the deaths of these men stands out as particularly egregious. They were in their own country. They should have been perfectly safe. The tragedy at Quinton's Hill was a catalogue of errors and a failure to enforce the safety procedures that were already in place procedures which had come about directly because of prior incidents. George Meakin was made redundant by the railway some years later, and, for a time, set himself up as a coal merchant. The obvious place to do this was right next to the railway where he could be easily resupplied. The place he chose? Quintin's Hill. During the Second World War, Meakin took a job in a munitions factory as part of the war effort until ill health caused him to take early retirement. He died in 1953. James Tinsley died in 1967. A common gripe of the working man in today's workplace is that health and safety has gone too far, and while that debate may have some merit to it, we must never forget the price that can be paid when safety is ignored or bypassed. George Meakin and James Tinsley found that out the hard way and had to live for the rest of their days knowing that the blood of 226 souls was on their hands. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative and entertaining. I can thoroughly recommend the book The Quintins Hill Conspiracy by Adrian Searle and Jack Richards. This book gives a highly detailed account of every facet of the disaster and the subsequent alleged cover-up. It was an invaluable source of information in the research for this script. Link in the description. I would also recommend searching YouTube for the short film The Signalman, based on Charles Dickens' short story of the same name. It has nothing to do with the disaster, but damn if it isn't a chilling tale. Unfortunately for my beloved British viewers, you can only see it if you have a VPN set to another country, as for reasons unknown, it is geographically restricted for the UK. Link in the description. Many thanks also to my dad Roger for unknowingly planting the seed for this script many, many years ago. I can vividly remember him sketching out the sequence of events on a piece of scrap paper as we sat in the station cafe at Kidderminster on the Seven Valley Steam Railway when I was 17, long before YouTube was a thing. Cheers, Daddio. Please like and subscribe for more, and I will see you on our next Descent into Darkness.